country and help people figure out what they want to do in their town. Basically, I'm in the before and after business. I help people visualize the place that they know, turn into the place that they would rather make it. And that involves a lot of uh, drawing pictures and making visuals and showing photographs and saying, do you mean like this or how about like that? And that's, uh, that's rewarding work because we get to come back a few years later uh, and see it happen. I actually work on the downtown Lake Worth Charette in the late 80s and early, and early 90s. <laughs> and uh, I, this kind of work is, uh, is rewarding because we get to work on cities. Um, you may have heard of the Harvard economist Ed Glazer who said cities are humankind's greatest invention ever. And that's a pretty August list. If you think about it, the, you know, the wheel is on there, the discovery of fire is on there, and the written word is on there. But basically, what he tells us is that um, because they're power to solve basic human requirements, um, like shelter and coming together for our security and for commerce and because we're social animals. And beyond that, because that's where we come to share ideas with each other, like we're doing today, um, that's what makes the city our, our greatest invention. So, I have a picture of Mata um, Street there from West Palm Beach is meant to remind us that uh, we have been in Florida, even in South Florida, uh, quite good in the past at producing those kinds of spaces in such cities that live up to that idea. Like you can walk down Clamata Street these days and you'll probably see somebody that you know and you can have a meal at the taco joint and somebody will go by and you'll, you'll leave with more ideas than you started. Well, that's not a new thing and I think the streets are like the most important piece of equipment inside that invention uh, because the streets are, are the spaces between all the buildings. So we have the, the buildings where we need to carry on daily activities, we need a certain number of square feet, we need a roof over our heads, uh, we need places for shelter. That's kind of basic, but in between those buildings are actually where we get our impressions of the place, where the story of the town is told to us, partly through its architecture, but partly through the architecture of the community. And that's not a new thing, that you know, street design's been like a hallmark of advanced civilization since the beginning, about 5,000 years uh, in the history of human experience. Uh, that's the Appian Way for those who get it. So all roads lead to Rome, right? The Romans uh, were able to conduct their empire uh, in part because they got good at street design. They standardized this chariot wheel spacing and they standardized the way of laying the stones in the road for a smoother ride and they could move their armies, but they also move messages and uh, and there and move um, and goods and services. So they were good at streets and therefore they got good at civilization building. Uh, and one of the things interesting about the, the Roman example is that not too long ago, transportation and communication were basically synonyms. They were the same thing. You sent a messenger down the street to get a message to someone else, or you went down the street yourself on foot or on horseback or a covered wagon or what have you, but the communications process involved going somewhere on a street. And I'd like to argue that um, now, streets still are communications devices. Like here, urban designers talk about something called the public realm. We're talking about that public room or space between the buildings where the buildings and the trees form the walls, uh, the pavement on the street and the sidewalks and forms the floor. And where there are street trees, the canopy provides the ceiling. And when that public realm is right, it turns into, into the most important feature of that great invention when it's working well, and that is creating a place where people want to be. And I think that the street trees are a critical in, uh, ingredient in that, and that's why I want to talk about it. But so it's the trees and the buildings and, the, and all of the other equipment but the, that go together in an ensemble. So when I talk to people about street design, I mean all of it. I don't mean just where you put the curb or how you space the lampposts or how wide the lanes are, that kind of thing. I, I mean the whole thing. What's the building to street relationship? And, how the trees in their planting through their geometry do something to reinforce that idea of the public realm. So, um, I mentioned South Florida, we used to be pretty good at it. I, I think Americans used to be pretty good at it. If you look through the history of city building in our country, uh, we had moments where uh, the building streets, we were as good at it as any civilization ever. And this, this interesting street in New York that 
um, in silhouette, you can get the general idea. If someone made a compositional decision, just like a painter composing on a canvas or a stage designer composing um, a set design, they, they compose where that that lantern on that civic building should be positioned. And they deliberately put it on axis where the street bends. And so if you stood in the street, not only would you be able to move back and forth with transportation basics, not only would you have an address for your buildings or whatever, but in the street you also were receiving a message about the importance of that institution inside that building, for example. So um, sending messages, not just moving cars. Um, John Massengale, my buddy from New York, and I were asked to write a big fat book, a textbook on street design. Um, it's a multi-purpose tool, and you can use it as a doorstop. It's awesome for that, but it also has 500 pictures in it. And the reason we made the book was uh, sort of subversive. We hoped that people would take the book to their public works director meeting, or their meeting with the mayor, uh, or the meeting with the DOT, and slide it across the conference room table and point to one of those pictures and say, why can't we have a street like that in Lake Worth? Or why can't we have street trees like that in West Palm Beach or Boynton Beach? And so that's, uh, we had quite an adventure making the book because it required a lot of travel and, and measuring streets and photographing and staying up late at night arguing about why some of those public realms were better than others. And in the process, we kind of had to forget a lot of what we knew. But for me, the most important moment in that journey was on the street right here. Right? You don't have to have this in, in its full brightness to get it. That's in Stockholm. And I stepped out into that part of the street which has the bike and walking trail lined uh, by these beautiful trees planted in rows to form an alley. And well, I took a picture of this. And I saw in the distance there was this guy on a bike coming toward me. And I thought, well, okay, perfect. Uh, I just took a knee. It was five degrees Fahrenheit, by the way. So I'm, I'm shivering a little bit while I'm waiting for this guy to pedal toward me. And I thought, I'll just let him get into the perfect place in the frame, and then I'll snap the shutter. And as I was waiting for him, I realized something kind of amazing. He was whistling. The guy was whistling. Now it was five o'clock in the afternoon, and he was on. He wasn't dressed in exercise clothes. He was coming home from work. So here's a person doing the most mundane of things, their daily commute. And he's whistling, and he's having the time of his life. It's this joyous experience. Now, just a quick show of hands. How many of us have a joyous experience on our daily commute? There's one. There's one. If you have a joyous experience, you're doing most of it on two feet two wheels. Now, the reason he could have this great experience is because someone had given him this gift. They did that most basic thing. They drew a map and they drew two lines on that paper and then they planted the street trees in alignment with regular spacing along those two lines. And it sounds really basic, right? Um, Bob, Bob Stern likes to say the first rule of design, line things up. <laughs> That's what they did. <laughs> but that, through that simple action and uh, straight, straightforward design move, they gave this guy and everybody else who ever experiences that space this incredible gift. And his daily commute is made a lot better than the people that are stuck on the turnpike or I-95 for their daily commute in the car. And so I, it kind of that you know watching that guy and getting that message kind of uh, uh, pumped us up, and we we, we took eighteen thousand more pictures <laughs> and we finished the book. <laughs> the big message from all the places we visited is that they vary a lot. You know, some streets look like this one that's in Spain. Some streets look like this one that's in North Carolina. But there are some common threads, uh, even in places as different as that, that are worth thinking about. Now, this street was designed by John Nolan, a great city planner who did much of the early planning in West Palm Beach. He designed Venice, Florida, and 30 or so other uh, towns and parts of towns around our state, some realized, some not. Uh, he was sort of the leading uh, planner and urban designer of his day. He was trained as a landscape architect. Uh, who went into city planning and kind of created the modern professional city planning as we know it now. And this was a neighborhood he designed in Charlotte called Myers Park. And so in the 19 teens, it's kind of unheard of at that time, he specified a couple of important things. He said, first, we're going to plant native trees. Now that, that doesn't sound radical to us because we've been hearing it for the last 20 or 25 years. And native trees are a good idea and they help with a lot of things. But 
he realized that they wanted the trees to thrive in these soils and this weather. Uh, they should go look at the ones that are already thriving in that place as opposed to bringing something from somewhere else and hoping to do that. So, first he said the trees should be native. And then he specified that six trees would be planted for every lot in the new neighborhood of Myers Park, including these on, on a street called Queens Boulevard originally planned for a, a streetcar as part of a streetcar suburb. Now whether someday they ever get that streetcar or not, or whether you're there, um, there's a little share the road sign in the corner, sharing it as a pedestrian or a, a cyclist, or you're just driving down the street, you get this amazing experience of traveling under that mature canopy, like you're in a climax park. Um, because not long ago they planted those trees. The experience of moving through that space is kind of like going down the nave of a Gothic cathedral where the arches are, are springing overhead, except in this case, instead of coming from the architecture, it comes from the landscape. And so, uh, Nolan, who, who should be a um, good example for a lot of us in Florida, wasn't the only one thinking like that in that time period. This is from Coral Gables, where our office is located. Uh, this is on Coral Way. And that's really not a great street for walking. Um, as it turns out. It's not. It's certainly not a great place to ride your bike, but it, you might be in your car and you might put the top down. And you can have this experience, and it's all because they planted these live oaks in a row, much like our friend in Stockholm. Um, I also love this street because the resurrection firms are growing on the branches, and so it changes every time you go there. It's greener or golder or drier or wetter. Uh, depending on, on whether there's been a rain and whether uh, what the light is that day. And so, um, Merrick had something right. Uh, he wasn't going to live long enough to see these trees grow to this level of maturity. But he, w he knew it was important. And so, in the, in the space of seven years, um, from the late 19-teens through the mid-1920s, George Merrick planted 30,000 trees. Wow. Uh, and all of the time since then, the city of Coral Gables has planted an additional 8,000 trees. So you get the idea, 30,000 trees was a really large number in a short period of time. That's enough trees, if you spaced them out 40 feet on center, like the, like the trees you just saw in Coral Way, they would stretch from Orlando to Key Largo. So that's pretty many, that's a lot of trees. But today, the city of Coral Gables has this amazing tax base, has these amazing uh, addresses, partly because of that investment. So this is Santa Maria Street, which is one of the, the streets we describe in the book. It's a skinny little street, and I go here a lot on my bike or if I'm going for a run, and I always see other people doing the same thing. Out of all the streets they could choose, why are they choosing this one? And it's partly because it has this amazing canopy and these great built the street relationships in an ensemble, like what I described. But there are wonderful details we could talk all day about just that one street, but you could, it doesn't matter what town you're in. You're, if you're in the part of town where people feel good about being there, like uh, say you're on Riverside Drive on the Upper West Side of New York, this is the kind of thoughtfulness that will have gone into that design environment. Um, that's one of the widest, busiest streets I've ever seen. This is the Avenida Diagonal in Barcelona, uh, which has um, traffic comparable to US-1 uh, in Miami Day, and more traffic by far than US-1 through Lake Worth. And yet this is the way the street looks. So, and also, by the way, they have dedicated space for transit, dedicated space for riding your bike, dedicated space for uh, walking and for parking and for those trees and for monuments. Uh, so they didn't give up on the wide roads or the important ones that were at a regional or cross town uh, importance. But you can also just go look at a humble main street. You'll probably also find in the ones that are successful and people keep coming back to, the ones that are Amazon proof because you can have experience there, you can't have by ordering it on your phone. Uh, the building, uh, the street relationships, the street trees, and the street design are all in an ensemble. There's a skinny street um, in Philadelphia. It isn't about width. So, you know, you can have a great street that's a really skinny street, you can have a great street that's medium sized. That's really good. You can have good. one that's colossal. There's a street in Aspen. I, I often will look when I'm in a place like that where I know they have a tourism economy and ask, now what are they doing to take care of the experience that their visitors have? Because their visitor industry is very fine-tuned. They have to give people an experience that people enjoy enough that they come back the next year or they come and they come back and stay longer. They tell their friends, we should go there uh, when, when we're taking a holiday and we can go anywhere we want. And that is a lot of what makes our economy go 
here in South Florida. So we should be curating those experiences in the same way. Um, now, that local distinctiveness that makes something memorable and tells you that picture is Paris instead of that picture is Lake Worth is also part of how you package those experiences. The, the, um, the Avenue Diana in Paris has this awesome accessory at the end, the Arc de Triomphe. Great little added deep flourish if you can afford it. Um, but actually, to me, what's amazing about it is uh, on a per acre basis, they pack as many cars into each block of the Avenue Diana under that beautiful street tree canopy as you find per acre in the Walmart parking lot. There's more than 400 cars on every block in the Avenue Diana, parked under the tree lines. And But what happens when you're actually there, across the crosswalk? What do you do? You look up and you see the Arc de Triomphe and you see the tree, tree trees. And you don't even think about the fact that this is actually a parking lot, although it may be the world's most beautiful parking lot. Um, <laughs> So Frederick Law Olmsted had this um, had a lot of really important ideas that shape modern city planning. The idea that we should be embodying this goal uh, of protecting the public health, safety, and welfare through the design of the places. And so his idea for parks and for uh, interconnected uh, boulevards and so on had a very high idea, which is that we're we're looking after the public and. Uh, so this street, which is in Buffalo, New York, named after Abraham Lincoln, was one of his great parkways. And what Olmsted did here was try to take his experience as a landscape architect and match it up with the rest of those goals, like being able to move around your city with dignity, no matter whether you're a rich person or a poor one, whether you're the, um, you know, an ordinary working person or you're the emperor, you should be able to have these experiences. That's the Avenue of the Emperors. Uh, in, in Beijing, and I just like to toggle back and forth between these because while there are some things that are the same, there are some things that are different. And what happens is there's a whole language that is given its own local fine-tuned distinctiveness uh, in the placement of street trees and the making of public space. Uh, this example is, is um, Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia. So if you can get an idea that there's something in common between Buffalo and and Beijing and Richmond that's trans or in Paris that's transferable, then it's a precedent you can use in a design. You should do it. Uh, now, the ones who, the, at least several of you, biked here from West Palm Beach. Yeah. Um, awesome. Way to go. I've had that experience. Uh, but I want you to think about what it's like to take that route. Um, on, your, on two wheels versus the kind of experience that this individual is having on a street like that. Where, not just because, there is space set aside for safe cycling that's separated from the moving cars, um, but because the, of the alignment of the trees and the making of the space, this, this person has like a, um, an elevated experience, right? They're, they're made to feel extra special in this place. Um, and so the street trees are serving the practical purposes, but they're also serving um, to make someone feel different about their day, right? Now, I've shown a lot of pictures of trees lined up or trees in long rows or uh, in sets, but I don't want to underestimate the power of a single street tree. Uh, if that's all you have room for, this one's in Newcastle, Delaware. Um, this one's in Micanopy, Florida. A single street tree can change everything. You know, it doesn't always have to be in sets. Uh, we'll look at this example from Oxford. This is uh, probably the most famous tree in England. Uh, it's on a street called Turtle Street. And it's an example of what the urban designers call a lean-in tree. It's in the adjacent garden, not in the sidewalks or a line in the right-of-way. It leans in over the street. But think about what I said about composition. It changes everything. It completely remakes the composition of the street, a single tree, right? So sometimes you can get the privilege of designing the whole space and doing some big and unified idea. And sometimes you just have to plant that one tree. Um, but you can make powerful effects either way. This is in Buenos Aires, and uh, where it gets pretty cold in the winter. And um, but even on a cold and dark day, they have a, a space there that's a rambla type format in the middle of the street. The trees are part of what makes you feel like you belong in that space. This is human habitat. 
Is that blowing in and out of focus as it moves? I don't know if that's it. Okay. It's probably doing a little auto adjustment. Okay. So there is this designed act, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the trees just don't end up there by default, they end up there because someone makes it happen. And if you don't make it happen, you generally speaking are going to do a bad job of protecting the public health, safety, and welfare. My, my friend Dick Jackson, a medical doctor, would say, later today this fellow will probably end up in an emergency room. If not today, then someday in the, in the coming 18 months. And when he gets there, he'll be diagnosed with dehydration or heat stroke, something like that, right? When really what he has is a street tree deficiency. <laughs> he has a uh, public realm syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we ask people, including our elderly people, to wait for the bus in this kind of situation. I bet when he comes to, someone in that emergency room will ask him, well, what were you thinking? walking to the bus or sitting up there in that hot sun like this. But really they should be asking the traffic engineer, the city public works director, the planning director, the mayor, what were you thinking calling that a bus stop? So if you go up to city place in West Palm Beach and you stand on Rosemary Street, one of the things that is uh, striking about city place is that at least for a couple of blocks, there are some buildings, um, some designed better than others, that are set up in an ensemble, right? And they deliberately make the space enough narrow that you get a lot of shade on the street. Some of them have arcades or colonnades or galleries coming out over the sidewalk. And so, uh, and there are street trees. And so if you look at one direction from this spot, this is kind of what you see. If you turn around and you look toward Okeechobee Boulevard, you can see this hard line where the shade you're enjoying right now is gonna end in about six seconds when you keep marching to the south. And when you march, out of that shade and start to approach the intersection from hundreds of feet away from the beginning of the actual crosswalk, you're in this exposed and uh, an alien landscape, which is uh, all about street trees. Now we give out keypads to people in big audiences. They have about 500 people or so reached not too long ago in a high school auditorium. We gave those little credit card sized keypad polling devices to them and we asked them questions. And one of the questions we asked was, <laughs> when you were a kid, did your parents talk to you about walking to school? And, you know, people raise their hand. And how many, just out of curiosity, how many of you remember your parents talking to you about walking to school when they were kids? Uphill, both ways. How many of us walked? <laughs> Five miles each way in the snow, uphill, both 30, ways. 30 inches of snow, minus right. 20 below all zero. <laughs> now they all knew the same story. All right. So a lot of us knew that. Now, so then we asked the same audience, well, what about yourself? So I'm going to ask you again. How many of you walked to school or biked to school when you were young? young? Sometimes. The kind of people who come to the festival. No, not all. <laughs> <laughs> all right, some of us. Yeah. And so you have an audience with the age ranges that I see right here, and that's a pretty typical response. You know what comes next. How about kids. your kids, your grandkids, or the kids in your neighborhood? Do they walk to school? And the answer goes way down. But, all right, Anne's got it. <laughs> the, now, this is not to suggest that neighborhood schools and safe routes to schools are the only indicator of a successful human habitat, because they're not the only indicator. The, uh, there are lots of other factors here. But, the, but it is kind of a telling thing that in the course of a single generation, the answer goes from this to that, right? And it's probably because of the way we made the place. So what can we do in those streets, uh, and how can we use street trees in particular to be more successful? Um, 